God, it's good that you have faith in God, but how do you practice that faith? How do you operate in that faith? What does it look like? What does faith look like? Faith is just faith unless we have it operating in our lives. Faith and trust is just trust unless it's operating. A lot of us say we believe, but when the actions come to it and we have to believe, we throw our hands up and we don't believe. A lot of us say we trust in God, but then when difficulties come, we don't trust in Him. A lot of us say we obey and we're, we're being an obedient to God, but then when God asks us to do something, we don't listen. We do what we want to do. We act like we want to act. So what does it look like to have operating faith? What does it look like to truly trust in God? What does it look like to have obedience? Let's go back to the scripture, and we're going to talk about this man and his son. And they brought unto them one that has uh, his son. He had a dumb spirit. And whoever taketh him, it teareth him, foaming at the mouth. And you can see this person was mentally disturbed, physically overwhelmed. The disciples could not cast him out. And he brought him to him. And now Jesus gets upset. And he said unto them, O faithless generation, how long am I going to be with you? How long shall I suffer? Bring him unto me. Jesus was upset. He was upset at who? His disciples? He was upset that they, I'm, I'm not going to always be with you. Why can't you do these things? I think he was a little upset at the father because the condition that he had and the situation he had, the father wasn't taking care of it and he was trying to rely on other people. So Jesus said, bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him. And when he saw him, the Spirit, so obviously the Spirit, when he sees Jesus, he realizes time is almost up, and he tries one last effort to take this man's life. He began to foam at the ground. I mean, he fall on the ground. He foamed at the mouth, and, he, and Jesus directed his attention not to his disciples anymore. He directed his attention to the Father. He said, how long has this child been with this condition? And the Father said, since a child. And he went on to explain, oftentimes he throws him into the fire, into the water. He's trying to destroy him. And then the man reaches out, but if thou can do anything, have compassion. Notice he says, if you can do anything. If you can do anything. So really he didn't know who Jesus was because he said, if you can do it. Maybe if you can do anything, just help us. But look here he says, help us and have compassion on us. Why is he saying have compassion on us if it's the child, the one that is with the disorder? Any parent who has a child, you know that when it's affecting your child, it's affecting you. Any person that has something that you really love something, when they're going through it, you're going through it as well. So not only did this child have a spirit, not only was this child going through it, but God, he was pleading to Jesus and pleading to God, have mercy on us because it's tearing us apart. It's overwhelming to us. It's, it's hurting our souls. Some people can't think right. They can't act right. They can't live right. It affects their sleeping. It affects their eating because of their child, because of their grandchild, because of what's happening. But he cries out to Jesus, if you can do anything, Help us. Jesus said unto him, If you can believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Straightway the father cried out and said unto him with tears, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. He knew that he, there was something he was falling short on. He knew there was something he was missing because his son wasn't delivered. Jesus gave him condition that if you want him to be healed, you have to believe. And when Jesus saw the people come running to him together, he rebuked the spirit and said unto him, Dumb and deaf spirit, I charge you, come out of him and enter him no more. And the spirit cried out and rent him sore and came out of him. And, we, and the, the child was left as dead. And so much that many said, he is dead. 
But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up, and he arose. And when he came come to the house, the disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast out this spirit? And he said unto him, some of these things, the spirit can only be come out with prayer and fasting. God says you might believe, but do you have operating faith? You might say that you trust me, you believe in me, but do you operate in that faith? I asked it as I was reading this, and I'm asking you the question, why do you think that God questioned the Father if the Son had the issue? Why do you think He actually questioned the Father if the Son had the issue? And we're going to go into three reasons, I think, of why He asked the Father. First thing, I think when our family is needs faith, we're the ones that can intercede for them, right? When our family, when our believers, when certain things are going on, when they're addicted to alcohol, when they're addicted to drugs, when they're going through a situation, when they're going through a divorce, when they're having something, who do they go to? But a spiritual mentor in their life, and they say, help me. And I'm sure this child went to his father for help. And we can intercede. And that's the reason I think God addressed, or Jesus addressed the father. Jesus also addressed the father and the mother, one of the spiritual leaders of the household, because of the father, the mother can't teach. You can't share what you don't know. So Jesus was addressing the heart of the problem that maybe this child couldn't deliver himself. Maybe this child couldn't be in a situation of peace because he never knew it because he never learned it from his father. And you can only give somebody something that you experience yourself. So he addressed the father. If the father is to be a believer, then he must be active belief, have active belief. He must have active faith. He must have active obedience. He must have active trust. And what do I mean by active? You can't just say you have faith. You can't just say you have trust. You can't say you just operate in love. you got to put it into practice. The Bible says you know my disciples because they love one another. If they're talking about one another, gossip about one another, they hate one another, that's not showing forth the love of Christ. That's showing forth what the world has. Active faith is when a situation comes, I trust in God. Active belief is when something challenges my belief in God, I stand on the practice and I engage and use it. The father at least did good by saying, help me in my unbelief. Because the father knew he fell short. He knew he was in the presence of God. So he said to him and cried out to him, Lord, help me in my unbelief. Most people just go through the motions. Or they act like they have faith. They act like they have belief. Yet when trials and difficulties and times come, they don't have active faith. They run to the world. They run to stress. They run to problems. That's why so many people are on drugs and alcohol and addicted to things because they want to numb the feeling of their hurt. They don't want to deal with the situation, the consequences. They don't trust in God for it, so they worry about it. They stress about it. So my question to you is, do you have faith? Or you just say you have faith? Do you believe or you just say you believe? The proof is going to be in the situation when trials and difficulty, like Jason said, is when a situation is going to come, you're going to believe. A lot of us say we believe. A lot of us say we trust a lot. of. But when situation comes and we don't understand it, we just throw it up and we complain and we gossip and we get mad at it. I've learned long ago that when you call yourself a follower of Christ, that God's going to give you chances and opportunity to use it. I'm going to repeat that again. I've learned long ago that if you call yourself a follower, if you call yourself a believer, that God's going to give you a chance and an opportunity to prove and to use and operate your faith. 
In a few minutes, I'm going to have my friend uh, Larry come and share with you a testimony that he has about operating faith. Because I think a lot of times when you go through the motions, and I'm not going to get into his testimony, but when you go through the motions and say you have faith and you say you have difficulty, and when difficulties come and challenges come, who are you going to turn to? You're going to turn to doctors. You're going to turn to your bank account. You're going to turn to others. Or are you going to turn to God? The disciples, it's interesting, the disciples actually ask God in the New Testament two questions. Any guesses about some of the questions that the disciples ask God? Anybody have any thoughts? You're not wrong if you say something. She didn't hear my message, she, even though she's in my household. But God asks, the disciples ask God, teach us to pray. We're going to get into that. What else, what else do you think the disciples might have asked? According to the scriptures, but what else do you think they ask God? Anybody else? Yes. Yeah, one of, the, one of the things they ask Jesus, it says, when you come back, what are the signs of your coming? So let me go into the two main questions that I think is the disciples can help us in this message. Luke chapter 17, verse 3 through 6. Luke chapter 17, 3 through 6. Take heed to yourself, brothers, if anybody trespasses against you. Rebuke him and repent and forgive him. And if he trespasses against you seven times, seven times in a day, and he says, I repent, forgive him. And the apostles, his disciples, said unto him, increase our faith. So they asked, he asked Jesus, they were asking God to increase their faith. And the Lord said, if you have the faith, the grain of a mustard seed, you can say to the sycamore tree, be thou plucked up, and plant it out of the roots, and, and it shall obey you if you have an increased faith. In Mark chapter 11, verse 22 through 24, similar to this story, said Jesus said unto him, Have faith in God. Why? Because I say unto you, Whosoever say to this mountain, Be thou removed and cast into the sea, shall not doubt in his heart, but believe, faith and belief, in these things he shall come to pass. And whatsoever you say, therefore I say unto you, what things you desire when you pray, if you believe in them, you shall receive them. So Jesus was talking about faith. He was talking about believing. Was he talking about an actual mountain? Was he talking about an actual tree that you're going to cast into the sea? What do you think? No, not an actual mountain. He can't just say, I'm going to pray that mountain is going to move and all of a sudden a tunnel is going to go through it. But what was he talking about? He was talking about something large in your life. Something that seems unmovable. Something big in your life or some kind of difficulties that only God can do. When you get to the point of saying, I can't do anything else, God. This is impossible. God says, that's where faith operates. That's where I want you to be. I can't do anything more with my job. I can't do anything more with these people I'm dealing with. I can't do any more with this marriage. I can't do anything more with this illness. I can't do anything more. God says, that's where I want you to be. Because now you have to rely on faith. Most of us say, well, I I, I don't want that hardness. I don't want that to come upon me. Well, good luck, because it's going to happen to you. When something big happens, God says, if you have faith, active faith, active belief. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 19, verse 26, And Jesus beheld them and said, With men things are impossible, but with God all things are possible. All things are possible. What's, what's are possible with God? All things. What's possible with man? Limited. With faith, belief, obedience, and trust, all things are possible. The great thing about God is God multiplies. God delivers. God sets free. God overcomes. God is a one, is a way maker. But most of us are being overcome, not an overcomer. 
Most of us are being delivered into things, not being delivered over things. Genesis said, be fruitful and multiply. God says, I'm the one that multiplies. Be fruitful and multiply. When Jesus took the five loaves and two fishes, he fed the 5,000. Jesus, what? Multiplied the little that they had. The lady who only had enough to feed her and her son in 1 Kings chapter 17 and only had enough for one more meal, God says, give it to me. And the prophet said, give it to me. And God multiplied it. God takes the little that we have. God takes the little life that we had, the insignificant that we had, and multiplies it. The best man can do is add or subtract. The devil wants to divide and separate, but God wants to multiply. I don't know about you. I'm not a big math major, but I think I'd want to have multiplication in my life, not division. If you hang around men or you hang around other people, they can add to your life. They can encourage you. But I'd rather be around a multiplier. One of the things my wife and I learned early in our marriage and one of the things that sustained us long in our life is I can't be God for her. She can't be God for me. I can't meet all of her needs. She has to be around a multiplier. The best I can do is add or subtract and I can make her life a little more comfortable. But this, the things that she needs is a multiplier. The things that she needs is a deliverer and I'm not him. But there is one that is here. It is him. So many times we put our faith in others. We put our faith in our jobs. We put our faith in our bank accounts. We put our faith in our children. We put our faith. And then when it disappoints you, the Bible says where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And then when that's gone or when that disappoints you, then you just give up. God says, don't give up. Trust in me. Believe in me. Act in me. The second thing that disciples ask from God is my... Beautiful daughter said it. In Luke chapter 11, verse 1, it says, It came to pass when he was praying at a certain place, he ceased, and the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. As a John taught his disciples to pray. And he said unto him, When you pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. In heaven as it is in earth, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who are indebted to us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. God was given them the perfect prayer, not to be repeated, not to done over and over again, but given them a guideline for them to trust in God. Because they didn't know how to pray. I know there's a lot of times when I get around people and they say, I just don't know what's going on. I say, do you pray? One time I bought my daughter a shirt because she was an RA in college and it says, did you take it to the Lord? Did you pray about it? When, God is, when people are complaining, when people are going through issues, when people are, are concerned, if they're a believer, ask them if they prayed about it. I don't know, I get around to it. I got to worry about it first. Well, let's pray about it right now and then lead them, help them. I'm convinced that the disciples asked for increased faith and teach us to pray. And the man asked for us to help my unbelief is because those are the things that are missing in the church the most. Prayer, faith, and unbelief. You would think that's where the place is that it has it the most. And yet the church is the place that are the most overwhelmed, the most stressed, the most abused. Why? Because if a Christian really knew what they had and the power that they had from God that was available to them, they could do extraordinary, extraordinary things that they could do. If a Christian really knew the power, really knew the possibility that they could move mountains, really knew that they could get rid of evil spirits. They really knew that their life could change. They really knew by faith in God alone that things could change. Then you would see more people 
in the church. You would see more people in the heart of God. I'm convinced that your problems are not too big. It's that your faith and your God is too small. Your problems are not too big. It's your faith and your God is too small. And what do you mean by that? What do you mean your, your God is too small? He's the same size. But yet, in your mind, in your heart, in your life, where is God? If your disease is higher and more pressing than your God, then your disease is going to dominate you. If your problem at work, if your problem with other people is more pressing than your prayer life, then you're going to trust in that rather than trust in God. When your God gets bigger, everything else, when your God gets bigger than anything and everything, then God says anything is possible. So how do I put into practice, Pastor? How do I actually do and activate my faith? How do I activate my belief? How do I get a better prayer life? How do I get into the victory of God? I'm glad you asked. In Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7, it says, For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Your thinking has a lot to do with your faith. Your thinking has a lot to do with where you believe. Because if my thoughts are concerned with the world, if my thoughts are concerned with the problems, if my thoughts are concerned with all the things and the stresses, then the stress is going to dominate you. But if my thoughts and my heart and my desire is for God, then God's going to dominate and God's going to take over and God's going to move the mountains and God's going to deliver you and God's going to set you free. Proverbs 18, verse 21, it says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. What does that mean? The power of the tongue. And they that love it shall eat the fruit of. You are what you speak. You are what you think. When you speak, and you're speaking about your problems, when you're speaking about your troubles, you're speaking about your difficulty, you're speaking about your anxiety, you're speaking about your stress, you're speaking about your, your, your family life, you're speaking about all the problems, all the struggles, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. I have problems, I have difficulties, I have stresses, but I talk about my God. I have problems at work, I have problems sometimes with my kids, I have problems problems sometimes with my marriage, but I talk about God and I elevate God and I fall to my knees because I want God to intervene because only he can break down those walls. You are what you think. You are what you speak. You are what you put in you. You want to change your life? Then do the little things. Change the what you're thinking about. Things change the what you're speaking about. And profess the things you want to believe. My wife has a habit of speaking to herself in the mirror. And she says, and sometimes I, I live in another room and I say, are you talking to me? She said, nope, I'm trying to get things ironed out. And she speaks to herself and looks to herself and sometimes she's speaking about me so I really don't want to go in there. And then every once in a while she'll come out, I figured it out. And then she gives me a plan that she's figured out, her and that person in the mirror. But she begins to speak to herself. But I remember the other day we were listening. As a matter of fact, even this morning, we were listening to K-Love Radio. Because a lot of times when I have Alexa in our room, and a lot of times rather than having, meh, 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 oh, I have music playing. And I remember we were listening to a radio and, she wasn't really thinking. I think I was ironing, getting ready, and all of a sudden we heard a man's testimony on the radio. And he was weeping, and he talked about how the song impacted him and touched him, how his mother was cheating on his father, and it, it really broke him, and it personally uh, really shook his faith, shook his things, and he took it personal. And yet he said, by listening to God's word, to getting into God's music, I realized that only God can handle it. And then as we were talking, we weren't even talking about anything else. My wife said, that's it. Amen. That's it. That's where we need to be. So rather than focusing on the things and the problems and the person in the mirror, we begin to start focusing on what God can do. That sometimes he turns 
graves into gardens. I don't know, putting God daily, putting God in your life, thinking and listening and speaking to God is where it's all about. I don't know if this was a song, but there was a song that we play here in the church, and it says, graves in the garden, it says, I've searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praises, the treasures of fate are never enough. Then you came along, and you put me back together again. Every desire, every satisfaction here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my faults, my flaws. Lord, you've seen them all when I call you my friend because God of the mountains is the God of the valley. There's no place your mercy and grace won't find me again. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. Lord, there's nothing better than you. You turn mourning into dancing. You turn beauty into ashes. You turn shame into glory. There's only you can do it. Only you. And that's what faith is all about. That's what putting trust in. Even, Lord, when I have unbelief, even when I have a lack of understanding, Lord, enlarge me. Are you ready? Are you ready for God to heal you? Are you ready for God to deliver you? Are you ready to God to increase you, to love you, to encourage you? Are you ready to stop saying about faith, stop saying about love, and start acting on that faith? Let us pray. Dear Lord God, Lord, thank you for convicting me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for sharing with me my heart and my desire and even revealing to me some of my weakness. Lord, I trust in you. Lord, forgive me of my lack of faith. Forgive me of my lack of prayer life. Forgive me of those things I have. Touch me and give me the honor and glory. Let me put my trust in you. In Jesus' name.